I shall introduce myself briefly. Um, uh, I, my name is Peter Forshaw. Um, I teach at the University of Amsterdam. Um, I've just come from teaching four hours about Paracelsus, the 16th century uh, rebellious uh, iatrochemist. Um, Peter's getting me time traveling backwards to the Middle Ages for you. Um, I've just uh, finally uh, written a book that seems to take me several centuries and has been sent off to Brill about a 16th century alchemist called Heinrich Kunrat, um, who practices Paracelsian chemical medicine, uh, is interested in gold making, uh, Chrysopoeia as well, as well as other more aberrant subjects like magic and Kabbalah. So I'm used to sort of interdisciplinary and hybrid forms of uh, alchemists and chemists. It seems really strange that I'm just talking in a void to myself, really. Um, but anyway, I hope you enjoy the talk. Uh, I have to say I am slightly intimidated that I'm giving it to all of you professional chemists or pharmacists, whatever uh, your background is. Um, I feel like Mr. Muggins talking to you, but I hope you enjoy the subject. Now then, again. Okay. We can um, hear you loud and clear. Yeah, I have a rather loud voice. Mm, yeah, big mouth. But I'm glad you can hear me. Thanks, Annie. Yeah, I'll try. I'll keep my eye on chat. Though when I've got the PowerPoint up, unfortunately, it's with with it full screen. I won't be able to see anything unless I can fiddle around with that. Um, the talk. Let me just check. The talk is 45 minutes, isn't it? Peter's going five minutes and 40 minutes. Questions? No. Good. Okay. Thanks, Alan. It was snowing this morning, but now it's quite warm. There we are. An update on Amsterdam weather. I've been here, oh, wow, 13 years now. Uh, 14 years. Peter's waving at me. Okay. Yeah. Wait. Uh, so start. Is that? Okay. Okay. I'm going to start. Thanks. Right. Okay. Share screen. I'll show this full screen so you don't have to see my ugly mug. Or maybe you do in the corner. Okay, so medieval alchemy in the Christian West. Peter asked me a long time ago to, if I give a talk on alchemy, and I blithely said yes, thinking I'd give 16th century alchemy, which to be honest is, is my focus time period most of the time. And he said, no, 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 medieval alchemy, that's proper alchemy, not this sort of chemistry uh, modification um, in the 16th century. So here you are. Um, I'm teaching an MA course on the history of alchemy right now. Um, and uh, I think giving my poor students information overload. Anyway, okay, medieval alchemy in the Christian West, let's begin. Um, alchemy enters the Christian West in what's sometimes called the 12th century Renaissance. Here is a scribe busy at work, um, possibly translating alchemical material. Um, in, uh, in the 12th century, you get lots of uh, a huge amounts of translation activity from Arabic um, on many subjects. I, I mean, on medicine, on astronomy, mathematics, um, and, uh, and also al alchemy. Uh, although, to be honest, no one really knows what it is so much at the time. And so alchemy is sometimes misunderstood as part of uh, astrology because it uses similar terms. The, the names of the planets are also used for the names of the metals. So there's a certain amount of confusion when it first arrives in, in the West. Um, I'm using immediately breaking Peter's rules by using a 17th century publication, but it's a handy way into the subject. Um, uh, the early translators, all of whom are clerics, so all of whom have uh, sort of religious affiliations and, and a, a particular religious way of looking at the material, um, introduce uh, people like the, the great grandfather, as it were, the inventor of alchemy, Hermes Trismegistus in Egypt. We get Maria, the Jewess, uh, sometimes classed as the sister of uh, the high priest Aaron and Moses. We get Democritus the Greek, and our story starts with Morianus the Roman. Um, and the first known alchemical work to appear in Latin on the composition of alchemy was translated in 1144 by Robert of Chester, so an Englishman, um, also the, the first translator of the Quran into Latin, so he's working on a variety of, of Arabic works. Um, on the composition of alchemy, in the preface, in the introduction to it, he writes that this book is divine and most full of divinity. It contains indeed the true and perfect proof of the Old and New Testaments. So I have to say, already at the beginning of the story of alchemy in the West, we're getting a rather 
lopsided um, inter introduction, really. OK, it's full of divinity and it proves the new, Old and New Testaments. OK, also unexpected for a historian of alchemy of uh, later periods is that alchemy is not a science, it's not an art, but it's introduced as a corporeal bodily substance. So forgive me, but I'm going to go through this because I think it sets up the way alchemy enters uh, our consciousness and, uh, and then modifications and juggling around to try and make sense of it. The standard etymology of alchemy generally is from the Greek term chemea, um, supposedly based on the verb keo, to melt or to make fluid, with the addition of the Arabic article al, you know, like algebra as well, uh, the art of melting, for example. Um, when you think of the 12th century translations, they're translating Arabic material into Latin, but also they're translating Arabic translations of Greek material. So you get, there's one text called the Crowd of the Philosophers, the Turba Philosophorum, which has horribly mutilated um, names of ancient Greek um, alchemists um, who pass through the mangle of Arabic into the mangle of Latin. So Zosimus of Panopolis, the first known historical alchemical figure from around 300 uh, um, CE, it becomes Rosinus. It's, it's interesting, intriguing, but sometimes the names are as confusing as the substances. The alternative title for this first work translated in 1144 is On the Transfiguration of Metals and the Occult, or Hidden, and Highest Medicine of the Ancient Philosophers. And again, it, it's, it's talking about, okay, the trans transfiguration of base metals, lead, tin, iron, copper, into noble ones, silver and gold. Uh, it's a preparation of a medicine, but here it's just to cure diseased bodies, they're leprous metals. And this rather religious sounding transfiguration of metals, like the transfiguration of Christ. But anyway, it is to do with metallic transmutation. Uh, chrysopoia for gold making and the, the less commonly used argyropoia for silver making. Okay. And what is interesting is we get this story that Morianus travels from Rome to Alexandria. Alexandria, of course, in Egypt, the home place of, of alchemy in the West. Um, he goes to study with Adfar, um, who turns out to have been identified with Stephanus of Alexandria, so a, a Byzantine alchemist of some re repute. And he teaches the Umayyad prince Khalid ibn Yazid. So we've got an intercultural exchange. Um, where Morianus, the Christian, is teaching uh, Khalid, um, the, the Arab, even though, to be honest, all the alchemy is getting transmitted the other way around, from Arabic to the Christian West. There are two great secrets of alchemy. One is the true matter that you begin with to, to achieve your end result, whether that's the elixir or the stone. And it's very vague in this text what exactly we're dealing with, and then how to prepare it. And Khalid, is he knows he's fascinated in the ideas of Hermes Trismegistus, who is a significant figure, but he, he lacks knowledge or information. Morianus here in this picture is pointing down to the ground beneath his student's feet, showing that the matter of the stone is found everywhere, even in dung, the vilest of matter. Anyway, here are one or two translations from the Latin text. Morianus says the first and principal substance, a matter of this thing, is one from one thing composed by one, to which nothing is added or taken away. It proceeds from one root, which afterwards spreads into many things and returns again to one. So here we've got sort of quietly and vaguely perhaps the influence of Aristotle, tutor to, of Alexander the Great, um, and, and you know known in the West for scholastic philosophy really. And the theory of hylomorphism, this idea that material bodies have two distinct entities, a qualityless matter, a material called often prime or primal matter, prima materia, uh, upon which is imposed a form, okay? Uh, and for, for Aristotle, this, this primal matter is a logical construct. It's, it's not something tangible, um, but, but it's there as uh, this idea that alchemists have by removing all the accidental qualities of the substance, its smell, its color, its weight, and so forth, they'd end up with this theoretical primal matter to which new qualities could be added to achieve the desired substance. Now, God had worked with or created universal primal matter in at the time of creation. The alchemists didn't generally think they were going to go back to that primal matter. Instead, they were content with working on the primal matter of the metals. And um, that's, that's what we're looking at. So, one theory, this idea of it's one substance, 
Um, but from this substance come four things, the four elements. And uh, uh, Morianus continues uh, explaining this. The four elements, that is heat, cold, moisture, and dryness proceed from one source. And it's quite curious. He doesn't give earth, air, fire, and water. Instead, he gives four of the qualities of them, the, of these elements. So they're sort of quasi-elemental building blocks of all substances. Uh, and each element known from this kind of diagram, each element has two qualities. Water, for example, is wet and cold. It shares the cold with earth, it shares the wet or moisture with air. Uh, you cannot transmute wet and cold straight into the hot and dry of fire. Instead, you have to rotate, keeping one quality and transforming another. So earth, dry and cold could be dissolved and transformed into cold and wet water, you heat the water, evaporate, and the element suddenly becomes um, you know, uh, evaporated or sublimate, and so on and so forth. So this idea of the rotation of the elements and the qualities. Um, now then, I'm just going to have to move part of the Zoom apparatus, otherwise I can't actually see what my text says. That's a bit of a problem. Um, so I actually can't Zoom. I'm just going to, as all things proceed from one, my magistry becomes substance and matter from one thing. This probably sounds as clear as mud, but it is actually a paraphrase of the most famous Ur text of alchemy, the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus. Um, we have this in Arabic from the 9th century, um, and we have it in translation during the 12th century. There are three different translations quite different from each other. We even have some, I have to say, nutter in the 17th century who claims to have a Phoenician version of it. Um, I somehow doubt that. But anyway, um, this is interesting. Uh, it's it's of great significance, this text. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Heard of it. Um, it's And it's influential. I mean, here's a 14th century painting at the top Topkapi in Istanbul um, of Hermes Trismegistus sitting there holding his a depiction of his emerald tablet. Um, and then we, we get a Latin version in the 15th century, for example, in the uh, Aurora Consurgans, um, with Hermes sitting holding a visual representation of his text. The, uh, by the way, the eagles above here um, are all connected with volatile substances, sometimes mercury, but also salamoniac. In Arabic, we discover that the, the word for eagle is also uh, a codename for um, for, for Salmoniac. I'm not going to go through all of this slavishly, though it is interesting. I'm just going to look at three lines. Okay. What is below is like what is above, and what is above is like what is below. This is um, a, a maxim which comes all the way through alchemy. Uh, on, on certain levels, uh, one obvious interpretation that comes up again and again is uh, what is above. Okay, well, you've got the seven planets of the uh, Ptolemaic cosmos with the sun and moon clusters planets. And these correspond with gold, silver, quicksilver, and so forth, the metals. Um, this is why at the very beginning of the translation um, uh, frenzy, um, you got people reading sun, moon, mercury, for example, and, and thinking it was all about astrology, whereas in fact, it was about lower astronomy, alchemy, um, occasionally with upper astronomy, not always. The above and below could also have other meanings. I mean, you've got the kokorbit here at the bottom, and you've got the alembic at the top, and basically, okay, the substance circulating like this is the above and below, unless, of course, you, you collect it at the receiver. Um, there are many interpretations over the centuries. It's quite fascinating to see how diverse they are. Okay, Morianus continues, uh, again, alluding to this, how that which is below ascends above, and by what reason that which is above descends below, and how it is one of them joined to the other, so that they mix with each other. Okay, the next, I'm going to give you, I'm just going to give you three lines, but this one is very interesting. Um, as all things were from the one, and again, you know, what is the one? I mean, is it primal matter, is it something else? By the mediation of the one, so all things were born from this one thing by adaptation. Uh, it's quite, I find it quite fascinating that from one scribal error, mediation um, becomes meditation. And uh, this gives rise early on in the Middle Ages to two different ways of interpreting this text. Um, no surprise, Isaac Newton on the left sticks with mediation. He's fascinated by the Emerald Tablet. You can go and find easily enough his translation of the Emerald Tablet. Carl Gustav Jung um, 
he's interested in the meditation, obviously, because of his psychological uh, reinterpretation of everything. But it's interesting seeing Newton's commentary, just as all things were created from one, and he takes it as one chaos, uh, the word from which gas comes, by the way, uh, but he's thinking of the very beginning of Genesis, by the design of one God, so in our art, all things, that is the four elements, are born from this one thing, which is our chaos, uh, particularly the alchemist's chaos, rather than God's. He's not trying to usurp God. Hortulanus, also known as John of Garland in the 14th century, has a different interpretation. For from one, a confused globe or mass by meditation, that is the cogitation and creation of one, that is the omnipotent God. So God thinking about things brings about creation and all things come from one confused lump, which is probably me sometimes, um, uh, by the sole commandment of God. Okay, so throughout the Middle Ages, throughout to be honest, the Renaissance, the early modern period and, and now, you get a multiplicity of interpretations. Um, this is a, a, a nice example of, uh, I'll give you one uh, variant interpretation. Its father is the sun, its mother is the moon, the wind carried it in its belly, its nurse is the earth. Again, going back to the, the four elements, these map quite easily. Its fire is the sun, its, its, its father is the sun, its fire, its mother is the moon, water, and the wind is obviously air, and its nurse is the earth. Well, we're told it's the earth. Um, so the four elements. But it's interesting that by the 15th century, the Aurora Consurgens um, has a variant interpretation. It takes that line that says, it should be noted that the philosophers have assigned different names to this operation. Some, for example, have said this work is achieved by calcination, that's father, sun, fire, solution, that's mother, moon, water, that's um, distillation, that's the air, sublimation, and then coagulation is the condensation of earth directly referring after to the same line. So I suppose what I'm saying is don't expect consistency in transmission. The text survives, but the interpretations vary. I'd say intellectually, I, it's extremely interesting. I mean, both it, the four elements and the idea of four significant processes in alchemy are intelligent approaches to what, after all, is, is a pretty perplexing and gnomic text. This uh, figure, by the way, on the left, is deadly Mercury, who is uh, putrefying uh, the sun and the moon, the male and female components of the gloss of stone by chopping off their heads. Um, yeah, thank God. I hope none of you do that in your laboratories. Anyway, Morianus continues. Uh, um, I'm not gonna stick just to Morianus, by the way, but I want to set this up really. Uh, an analogy with the human body, the idea of the microcosm, both the alchemical Vessel is a little world or microcosm, and the human being is a little world or microcosm uh, in relation to the greater world, the macrocosm. As the four elements are contained in the human body, so God created them, situated and distinct and, unite and united, also collected and diffused throughout the whole body. Because they merge into one body and hold it together into one, and yet each one of them accomplishes a work different from the work of another. So they're all united, but they're all distinct in their properties. And, and then, although they are in one body, yet they have a different colour and a different domain. So, OK, um, moving on, <laughs> plodding on, we've gone from primal matter as the, the essential um, uh, the theoretical construct. Then we've got the four elements. And then we've got color changes in alchemy, which basically indicate whether or not you're on the right path with an experiment. Um, and there are three main ones, black, white, and red. Black is generally related to calcination or burning. You burn it, it goes black, as well as to putrefaction or decay. Um, in the Middle Ages, based on a biblical verse, you have this idea that actually, unless a seed falling to the ground, decays, it can't germinate. So we have this curious idea of putrefaction before growth, uh, rather than just decomposition. Um, the white process is connected with washing. You wash the salts and, and everything becomes eventually white. Um, or um, the white elixir or white lunar stone. There are two end products. One is the lunar stone, which converts base metals to silver. And then the redness is the red or solar stone that converts base metals, including silver, uh, to gold. Okay, there are other colors, um, but these are the, the main ones. And just to, to warn you, the putrefaction here involves sex as well. Um, uh, it's uh, 
sorry, uh, lowering the tone. Uh, here we have th this idea of conjunction or coitus. The, we have um, the idea of different metaphors for how alchemical processes work and sex, sexual union is one. Um, you know, you unite substances and they produce a third, they produce a child. Um, you've got other metaphors, you've got the, the idea of an egg as a metaphor, that an egg con contains everything in it that it needs to produce the chick, except warmth, and the alchemist, uh, the art of fire produces the warmth or the incubator um, for producing the stone. Um, other ideas are seeds uh, that grow into trees, for example, but I have to say, sex is a robust favourite. Okay, now then, where am I? What's the source of this primal matter? Uh, don't forget, it, this is the first alchemical text that people have got, so they're quite reliant on it. God created the world from four different elements, yes, thank you, Morianists, and placed man as a greater ornament among the elements themselves. Man is the, that's the world. Then this phrase must have been so perplexing. From this thing is this, sorry, this thing, this product, this alchemy is drawn from you. You are also the mine, uh, as in, you know, mining minerals and metals of which you exist, for they find it with you. And to confess it more truly, they receive it from you. This must have given rise to so many horrible experiments with, as I've put, blood, sperm, urine, feces, hair, nail clippings, you name it. Um, later alchemists are often appalled by this. Uh, the, the guy I've just written a book about calls them cadaverists because they're so interested. They take literally reading this as is from you, but I have to say, I can't say I blame them if they're reading this text. Um, it's perplexing. It changes in later texts, but Imagine getting this as your introduction, your, your Alchemy 101. And anyway, in this stone, we finally find what the product is called. This is pages later in the text. Oh, it's a stone. You're talking about a stone. Um, four elements, and it's likened to the cosmos, okay, to the composition of the world, okay. Um, no other stone is found in the world that's like it. So finally we get the Philosopher's Stone, okay. Next, I'm going to jump a bit of time. I could talk about um, Albert the Great, who was fascinated in this in the 13th century, writes a book on minerals, where obviously uh, an interest in the stone of the alchemists uh, contributes to his interest in minerals. Um, Roger Bacon in the in England is interested in alchemy for the aid of the church, but also potential for medicine as well. So early on, we get it's not just about transmutation, there are other possibilities. Geber, um, it, on this text, if you see Geber Philosophus, this says, this is, um, uh, well, Geber is actually a, a sort of invention. Pseudo Geber is what historians talk about in the West, but it's based on the teachings of the Sufi, uh, alchemist Abu Musa, well, Abu Musa Jabi ibn Hayyan. This is an image from uh, Florence. Pseudo Geber, the sum, summa perfectionis magisteri, the summation of the perfection of the mastery or magistery around 1300. This is undeniably the most influential medieval work of practical transmutational alchemy. Um, and laboratory apparatus. Um, you don't really get illustrations of that until publication uh, with the invention of the printing press, but you really get the sense that this is someone who's working practically. Um, he describes the substances he's working with, um, the minerals as well as the metals. Um, he, he describes laboratory equipment. He's got a knowledge of the technology of the laboratory. Um, he may be mentioned as God once, um, and calls the work divine once, but basically he's hands-on um, in the laboratory. He's also um, Jab Jabir and then Geber, the, the Latin version um, of him, pseudo-Geber, are famous for transmitting the sulfur-mercury theory. The idea that um, all stones, and particularly the philosopher's stone, the end goal, are a combination of sulfur and mercury. Uh, and, and we get this from sulfur and quicksilver, as with nature, so the art produces metals. So nature produces um, uh, uh, me uh, metals from com combinations of sulfur and mercury, so does art. So art is copying nature. This is really inspired again by Aristotle, his book on meteors, Meteorologia, particularly book four. Uh, this image on the right, you can see two vapors. This is sulfur on the left, and that's mercury on the right. 
exhalations rising from the earth generating stones below ground or whether above ground. Sulfur is smoky and dry, fiery male sulfur. Mercury, moist mercury is vaporous and moist. This is meant to be Thomas Aquinas pointing to this stuff and for once saying it's okay. Um, okay, forgive me if I blather on a bit. Basically nature creates uh, does alchemy, but it takes a long time. So metallic transmutation is a natural process going on underground, but taking hundreds or thousands of years. Miners and refiners finding metals rarely find a pure single metal. The lead, for example, often contains silver, silver ores, some gold and so forth. Base metals naturally transform underground into noble ones then, that's the belief, you know, you find some lead with some silver in, then the lead is doing its best to become silver, but you know, don't sit there and wait for it to happen. Groundwater leaches away impurities found in these base metals, the heat of the earth gradually cooks them, and this is what an alchemist is trying to do. Um, but obviously in a sort of quicker process, unless their name is Methuselah, the alchemist. Um, the gold maker needs to find a way to do it. And, and that's what they're trying in the laboratory. The questions become though, to what extent do you, uh, do you copy nature? And also how does transmutation work? Do you move sequentially from the basis of metal, lead to tin, and then gradually end up with gold? Or can, we, can you find a way of speeding up the process and jumping from copper to silver or copper to gold, for example? Different alchemists have different ideas about that. Okay. Geber's theories are actually quite straightforward, really. They sound quite sensible. Metals are all compounds of the same ingredients, namely mercury, sulfur, and some impurities. Gold is the most perfect. It's very stable, it resi resists corrosion. Uh, it shows it's got the perfect proportion of mercury and sulfur, and also a very tight combination of particles, uh, uh, tighter and which makes them denser than the other metals. Um, however, if you look at some, tin and lead, for example, they've got too much mercury, which is why they have low melting points. Iron and copper, which have far higher melting points, are, have too much inflammable, dirty, dry sulfur. So that, you know, that's why fiery sulfur is there when you, you throw iron filings in the fire. It's, you know, they burn up because they've got too much sulfur in them. So the alchemist tries to well, they have a choice. Do they separate the metals into their original ingredients and recombine them in different ways to turn one metal into another? Or do they cheat and find an agent of transmutation? And this, this, this is where we get the search for the Philosopher's Stone or Elixir. Yeah, something that when combined with the base metal brings about the transmutation. Okay. Some alchemists, um, the guy I wrote about, Kunrath in the 16th century, he talks also about lesser stones or elixirs, which transform one particular um, base metal into gold, like copper into silver, for example, or silver into gold. These seem to be um, less ambitious, but um, he, he feels he's on the way to that. Others seek, seek the uh, universal agents, the true philosopher's stone or elixir, which can transmute any base metal into gold. And these, the stone was believed to be so powerful that it could transmute hundreds or thousands of times of its weight of base metal into silver or gold. And now it's an optimistic belief, but it's supported by observations in nature. If you throw vinegar into a barrel of wine, <gasps> shock, it transforms it all into vinegar. If you add a bit of rennet into milk, it turns it into cheese, a small bit of leaven dough kneaded into the dough mass, it leavens the entire mass. So you know, they're, they're looking at nature to try and find um, inspiration for their own practice. Anyway, I'm going to move on to another figure, but I just mentioned this. He's really practical. He's very down to earth. But what is interesting is he's also concerned about secrecy. He doesn't want his ideas to fall into the wrong hands. And don't forget, this is before publication. So he's saying, please be careful whom you pass on this manuscript to. At the very end of his Summa Perfections, he writes about dispersa intentio, dispersion of knowledge, where he says instructions for it are, are not necessarily written in the, in the right order. Um, some parts are very fragmentary. Sometimes you have to go and look in different copies of manuscripts to find everything. And he writes that he's scattered information even in the chapters of his book and warns that he, where you think he's writing most openly, he's often really concealing things. 
which of course makes you a paranoid reader, really. You have to go back and check things. Um, but it's noticeable that this technique continues and the concern for uh, secrecy. Um, I don't have manuscript copies really of, of any equipment, but really with the dawn of printing, you start seeing early publications. And I have to see, say you see a lot of um, very interesting uh, examples of equipment. I mean, okay, this is the first style of distillation. Second style, we, we know it's an alembic, for example, uh, here, okay, using a, sh a shell and a, a receiver. And, and um, uh, there's another third way of distillation, but you get lots of equipment. And I have to say, I find it fascinating to see the transition over the decades into the 17th century, particularly where you get some extremely good texts. Someone called Libavius, uh, has a fantastic collection of laboratory equipment um, on this in, in one of his works. And um, slightly later, Johann Daniel Milius has another one where you really see how well read they are um, in manuscript and, and publication culture. Anyway, I'm going to jump to someone substantially different. It's not simply a story of um, the hermit Morianus um, writing about alchemy in a very Christian sense, and, and then Geber coming along and writing in a very practical sense. If Gabriel's writing around 1300, this is 1330, Petrus Bonus of Ferrara, the new pearl of great price, and um, good biblical scholars that I'm sure you all are, you'll know, you'll recognize Christ's parable of the merchant in Matthew 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like to a merchant seeking good pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went his way and sold all that he had and bought it. And, and to be honest, um, this is a sort of little joke and a wink as well, because the Philosopher's Stone wasn't believed by this time to just create um, met gold, for example. It could also create artificial gems, including pearls as well. So the new pearl of great price is also the intimation of a product of the Philosopher's Stone. Bonus's main focus, though, is on supporting belief in alchemy. And he's responding to scholastic Aristotelian criticisms, university doctors who just poo-poo the idea of chemical change and transmutation. Uh, he displays an immense knowledge of Aristotle's work. I mean, it, it, it's impressive if you're into Aristotelianism. Meteorology, physics, metaphysics, generation and corruption, his works on animals, his, even the works on the soul as well, they all come into um, uh, his arguments uh, where he basically proposes um, negative um, evaluations of alchemy and then he demolishes them. Uh, but he also introduces a new dimension into the story. He says, yes, alchemy, of course, is natural, but it's also supernatural and divine. And this is interesting because why should people be interested in alchemy? Yes, it should be for the useful practical products, but more than that, it's a sort of cultural and religious dimension, a profound identity between alchemy and Christianity. And he actually says that knowledge of alchemy helped ancient philosophers before the birth of Christ to predict fundamental tenets of faith. So basically anyone practicing alchemy properly becomes Christian, okay? Knowledge of the generation of the stone had provided pagan philosophers knowledge and observable proof, apparently, of Christian doctrines. Here, should any unbeliever truly know this divine art, it would of necessity make him a believer in the Trinity, okay? Uh, he would believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord, okay? He, you would know in advance of Mary's immaculate conception, of the miraculous incarnation of Christ, of the last judgment, and particularly the resurrection of the dead. Now, Martin Luther, who was um, never a fan, for example, of astrology, but he liked alchemy because it gave proof of the res resurrection of the dead. Okay, uh, so it's the significance greater than you'd think. By basing transmutation on the incarnation and making an argument by way of analogy, Petrus Bonus justifies transmutation. So the Bible guarantees the truth of alchemical um, uh, my, this, uh, contents, thanks. Uh, this, this, okay, Zoom bar is getting in the way. But to be honest, I would say more than that, I, it's a two-way street. It's not just that alchemy is being supported by the Bible. The idea is that alchemy actually comes, uh, it, alchemy is good at transmuting infidels into Christians as much as it is. It's, there's a second layer of meaning. It's, there's, there's transformation on, on, uh, on religious levels as well. That's the implication. 
Okay, another person, pseudo Lul. Now, Ramon Lul, the, the genuine Ramon Lul, uh, disapproved of alchemy, but uh, he was famous as a missionary who was eventually stoned to death. Uh, but his ways of communicating, where he had uh, wheels um, that uh, you could, in, in some ways, he's classed as one of the, the ancestors of. Uh, computational logic. He had various wheels that you could actually uh, sort of pin together on, on paper and rotate to generate uh, different permutations of ideas. Uh, some enterprising alchemists liked this and started um, producing pseudo Lullian texts. The Testamentum uh, is the first of these written in 1332. So around the same time as, as our previous figure, Petrus Bonus, good stone, by the way, Petrus. So we have metallic transmutation, but we also now have uh, an interest in he human health and the production of artificial and precious stones. And what is interesting is that God's creation is discussed in alchemical terms, the creation of the greater world or as a, from a matter confuser, but we get it all couched through Aristotelian ideas and alchemy. So this is interesting. In later in centuries, it really worries theologians who say you're reducing God's miracle to something understandable in the laboratory. I mean, sort of, you can see where they're going in a way. Anyway, here we've got angels. Um, we've got um, uh, you know from the quint who were created from the quintessence and fire. You know, very pure um, element. Um, you've got heaven, slightly less pure. The world. That's pure, and then nature as the sort of administrator of all this. Here you've got the four elements, fire, air, water, and earth, and a substantia quinta, a fifth substance. You've got the qualities of um, hot and dry, for example, that I mentioned from that diagram earlier. Um, but you've got these, which I do find a real change in style. It's communication stops being just verbal and you get these diagrams to reflect on relationships. At the center of this, we've got hule or highly, um, primal matter in Greek. Uh, and then you've got other substances it relates to. So you've got the elements, you've got vapors of the elements, you've got clear water, you've got azok, vitreous azok. Azok actually is just um, a transliteration of al zauk, um, the Arab word for mercury, quicksilver. But by we, the time we've got here, it's a mystifying name. No one really is sure. They just know it's something primal that's important in alchemy. Uh, by the time you get to the 16th century, it's totally different. It's azot, and the argument is it's made of the first and last letters of the Roman, Hebrew, and Greek alphabets. So A and Z, um, Aleph and Taf in, in Hebrew, and Alpha and Omega in Greek. Primal matter and ultimate matter. Um, but here, yeah, it's, it's a mystery. Vapors of vitriol, vitriol, of course, extremely important for acids. Um, sulfur, yes, and, and then metals. Okay, so, um, and there are many of these. I mean, here is a nice uh, manuscript. Um, it's, it's slightly, it's about 1525 from memory. This, damn it, my screen, where is it? Yeah, 1524. Um, but you see how you've got alchemical apparatus and you've got a whole range of these diagrams. This text in St. Gallen is actually full of them. Um, and they, yeah, they, permutations of these ideas are almost like thought experiments as well, where people try out ideas, okay? And, and also analyze the results they get by with reference to those diagrams. Okay, what else? Pseudo lull also introduces new notions. Uh, this idea, the idea of compounds of mercury and silver as a hermaphrodite, a union of masculine and feminine principles, um, or as a conjunction or an eclipse. Um, you still find people using astrological ideas, um, so conjunctions, the bringing together of substances, but the conjunctions of planets. So, and the sun and moon, particularly as symbols of uh, the sun as sulfur and the moon as mercury, so an eclipse. Um, but here it's just the word, it's a hermaphrodite. Uh, uh, you, you've got the, uh, you know, the idea of the hermaphrodite in Ovid's Metamorphosis and so forth, um, but it's, it starts to be used in alchemy. Uh, sometimes also um, it's no longer just a binary of the sun and moon united, but also the idea of a ternary, that mercury is a mediator between the two primal substances of the stone. Sometimes mercury is a priest that marries the two together. Uh, we also start seeing um, a gradual increase of appearance of the alchemical bestiary, the idea of substances like dragons, lions, and ravens. Uh, and when people look at these, they're often bamboozled. Uh, but to be honest, dragons are poisonous 
deadly creatures. Um, they lurk in caves. So if you think of the alchemical vessel, the bottom of the vessel is a cave in which your monstrous creature, usually a reptile, so it's a dragon, it's a snake, it could be an, uh, a wyvern if you prefer, <laughs> two-legged dragons, uh, it could be a toad, you know, but reptiles, they're usually poisonous mercury. Um, Lions are different substances. Uh, sometimes they're vitriol. For example, the green lion that devours the sun uh, is connected with vitriol. Ravens represent blackening, uh, that it's more a process than a substance or its putrefaction and so forth. So to be honest, unpacking these images isn't quite as weird as you'd think. Uh, though I have to say some of the Ex ways of expressing it in these early texts is more perplexing. I've not come across this before. Uh, and that which is more cooked and more restrained by nature descends from high in the air in the form of a black raven whose head is red, feet are white and eyes are black. Uh, so we've got the three color changes, but why particularly the head is red and the eyes are black, I'm not really sure. But we've got sort of the putrefaction, the, the lavation, the washing and so forth there. What I find interesting when you look at medieval alchemy and early modern is some of these ways of communicating survive and others don't. This one doesn't particularly survive very well. You, you, you get the feeling people are perplexed, they read it, they're not sure, but they keep the colour changes in the raven but drop the that. Okay, looking at the time, yeah, okay. Time for another alchemist, slightly later. 20 years later, uh, this writing, it's a Franciscan. A lot of Franciscans are, are alchemists. You know, it's interesting, the Franciscan vow of poverty, but they're all trying to make gold or, or other things. John of Rupestissa, um, in around 1350, he writes the Book of Light, and he has religiously oriented girl, goals, not girls, or maybe girls as well, they could be nuns. Anyway, Philosopher's Stone will be of great benefit to the Roman Church during the time of the Antichrist. Uh, the church shall be tormented and have all of her worldly riches despoiled by tyrants. That uh, doesn't seem to have happened yet with the Roman Catholic Church. But anyway, um, he's, he's sincere about this. Um, uh, this is not spiritual alchemy. It's, it's alchemy done for the church. The gold and silver produced by alchemy will help attenuate the poverty of the elect, uh, the spiritual Franciscans of whom he is one, and provide them with means to fight against the Antichrist. And this is a realistic writer. He says, oh, by the way, be warned, the Antichrist is also an alchemist, but he does counterfeit gold, so be careful about that. And uh, what is interesting is that he's, okay, he's a Franciscan. Yeah, he's a friar. Um, he is deeply imbued with Christianity. So he discusses alchemy in Christian terms, but he's not away with the fairies. He's, he's talking about laboratory processes, but the way he's doing it is, is through parables. Um, he actually refers to an earlier parabolic treatise by Arnold of Villanova, who's a, a famous uh, doctor um, who also believed he was a prophet, who, for example, this. Master Arnold says that it's necessary to raise up the son of man in the air by means of the cross, which in literal terms means that the material that was digested after being ground finely is put at the bottom of a flask to be dissolved. And the purest and most spiritous of what is there is then taken upwards into the air and is raised up in the cross of the head of the Alembic, like Christ who was raised up on the cross. Um, I have to say that sounds grim. Uh, it makes all of you chemists working in laboratory tormentors of Christ uh, to a certain extent, which is, is rather odd. Um, uh, but to be honest also, I mean, Larry Principe, whom some of you may know, um, historian of alchemy in Baltimore at, St, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins, said, you know, there's a pun going on here. The idea of the alchemical crucible and the cross, they both come from the same root. So he's playing with that. But it is at first peculiar when you read this material that, you know, isn't this blasphemous? I, I find it interesting that after the Reformation, in the 17th century, Reformation Protestants, the Rosicrucians, say you should not use the passion of Christ to talk about alchemy. It really is um, abusing the divine word. But here you've got monks and Francis, uh, you know, using it happily. Um, William Newman says one of the things is that it elevates alchemy, um, it elevates the discipline to a quasi-supernatural status. The conversion of base metals into gold is now a simulacrum of Christ's torments. I still find it weird that the alchemist is the tormentor, you know, uh, but nevertheless, that's the process. 
Okay, a couple of years later in his, this is his most famous book, Book on the Consideration of the Quintessence of All Things. He distills quintessences. He's not looking for um, gold. Uh, he's interested in more impossible gold, drinkable gold as a medicine. Yeah. And he covers so many substances in the book, including narcotics. He has a whole section on those. But he's most famous for the preparation of alcohol distilled from wine to make the aqua ardens, the fiery water or watery fire of the alchemists. And he's well aware of its antiseptic, its disinfectant qualities, and also where it preserves meat, fish and fowl, he enthusiastically tells us. Why? For rejuvenation, treatment of incurable diseases like leprosy, paralysis, but also mental ailments, I'm sure the alcohol held that, fear, melancholy, anxiety and so forth. So alchemy is, is going in, in quite a lot of different directions. He also discovers, discusses technology. He goes into quite a lot of detail about the alchemical furnace or ethanol. So he's, he's read his Geber in the past. And this book is one of the most widespread works of the Middle Ages. It was really popular. You know, not exactly the Harry Potter of the day, but nevertheless, it's very well. Okay, in the last part of the talk, okay. I'm sorry, I've probably gone over a bit of time, but I, it's not too much. Okay, in the 14th century, we begin to see images. Okay, we'd have diagrams, but these are figurative images, pictures. Um, uh, the, in, this is a rather inglorious one. The, the Codex of Gratius, Son of Philosophy, in Vienna um, now, these manuscripts. We find the image of Christ rising from the tomb. The tomb is the alchemical vessel, the furnace, or, or the glass vessel, depending on the individual writer. And Christ resurrected is the stone. Okay. Um, now, that's... Not so glorious, the previous one. This, I have to say, is beautiful artwork. Frater Ulmanus, another Franciscan, they get around um, in his Buch der Heiligen Dreifaltigkeit, the Book of the Holy Trinity, is a bizarre mix of alchemy, imperial politics, and Marian religion, the Virgin Mary. Uh, written around the time of the Council of Constance, convened by uh, Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund, to put an end to the Western Schism. And it's a curious book. It's trying to unite okay, um, religion and politics, but it's as in bringing about the union of people who are schismatic, but also it's talking about alchemy in a bizarre way, um, but in an extremely interesting way. Here you have the Virgin Mary, who is given a great deal of significance in this text, holding Jesus, who also happens to be an imperial double-headed eagle. Okay, and, and the aim of the book is, this book openly proclaims to Jews, pagans, Christians, and heretics, the one true, all-encompassing Christian faith, that Mary is the mirror of the Holy Trinity, as great as Jesus, high in the Godhead. And the argument is that she's a mortal vessel for an immortal God, okay, for, for Jesus. Um, it's a, and it's a peculiar combination. You've got Jesus, you've got St. Francis having his vision, and then you have a Christ eagle, form of the mirror of the Trinity. And if, if you start looking, you start seeing crowns all over the place. In, in, when you count all of these in diagrams, there are seven crowns, one for each metal. And uh, basically, the process of mortification, calcination and purification are symbolized by Christ's sufferings. Uh, it's not just a metaphor. There are recipes encoded like this. Christ's double nature as God and man suitably designates quicksilver because quicksilver contains lead and gold, in fact, all metals. And Christ crucified, for example, calcined the copper. This is verdigris crown. Um, and, and it's transformed by Christ's power into gold. But you get recipes where it says, take several ounces of each of these metals is a different Christian virtue. So uh, it's it's peculiar, but it's really encoding alchemy in Christian text. We get the same Christ and the tomb, where the tomb is the alchemical vessel, where mortification takes place, for example, but also transformation. And there's Christ as the philosopher's stone. We have a very Hello Kitty aesthetic uh, as well, for some reason. I don't know why it's so pink for the apparatus. But if you see, these are pretty faithful representations of laboratory equipment, but juxtaposed with, with Christian motifs. Here is um, a, a manuscript copy which is slightly less glorious than the one I've been showing you in Munich. This is in Castle. Um, 
near the Brothers Grimm Museum. I, I, I call this to my students the Planet of the Apes manuscript, because really, if you look at the figures, they're pretty awful. But if you look, this is the torment of Christ uh, on a wheel uh, rather than cross here. It's the torment of the stone, the you're sort of breaking it up. Uh, the crucifixion is the dissolution of the stone. The deposition is the distillation of the stone. The entombment is the putrefaction of the stone. And then we have the final operation, the resurrection, is, is the stone itself, the, the, the final product. So parallel processing. You've got Christianity, but Christianity becomes a vehicle for alchemy. And Jesus becomes the ultimate hermaphroditic compound, a unity of contraries, of human and divine, male and female, because in this text it's really with the Virgin Mary and analogous to the stone. We also get, okay, here's the coronation of the Virgin. And art historians say this is a very unusual representation of her. You've got the Holy Spirit, Jesus and God the Father crowning her before she ascends in bodily form to heaven. You've got the four evangelists here, uh, represented by their creatures and it's weird that it's, if you I shouldn't keep saying weird it's very interesting that you find each of the four creatures of course linked with a different evangelist but with a different metal a different element and a different color and you start once you've read this you go back and look at the other images and see you have to hunt around to to, to make sense of it but the colors are coordinated they represent specific things in the other version the planet of the apes version they even explicitly say that, for example, here the eagle is sal ammoniac. Um, uh, the uh, salpeter is for Mark's lion. Cinnabar, which I'm sure you know, is mercury sulfide. It's mercury and sulfur, the two ingredients of the stone united. Uh, and then the angel for vitriol. But curious again to find this. It's, uh, it's another way of communicating alchemical ideas to basically a, a priestly milieu. It also has hermaphrodites. I mentioned that Ramon Lul talks about hermaphrodites, but now we get visual representations of this. And these represent perfect, successful compounds. And, and everything means something. So, for it, well, okay. The wings, gold is the sun, blue is the moon. Okay, so sulfur and mercury. Um, the red is blood of Mars or mercury of the sun. The white is sal ammoniac. The coiled snake is fixed male sulfur. The three snakes in the chalice are volatile mercury. You've got a solary, th this is meant to be a plant, Lunaria was a plant connected with the sun and the moon. You've got um, a sulfurous mountain and a mercurial mountain. Um, so, you, you know, there's a lot of redundancy built into this. And then you've got this two-headed dragon. If you are a sad scholar like me, you know that's an Amphis Baena. There you are. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, that might be useful. Um, but you get this, and this is a successful image. It gets picked up by later books and, and, and uh, authors. This is an unsuccessful one. It probably scared the willies off people, actually. This figure, and this is not me, this is the text. Note well this figure of cruelty and eternal death. Lucifer the Antichrist and his mum. I don't know who on earth Lucifer's mother was. Lilith? I'm trying to guess. A body fixed and volatile whose roots are the seven deadly sins and the abyss of hell. And here they, oops, sorry about that. Um, Freudian slip there. I call these virtues instead of vices. Oh dear. But anyway, I think you get the message bad. Okay. But you, you can, again, this sort of correlation, colors, metals, and so forth. But it's interesting how that one survives. This one gets dropped. Okay. Final thing to show you. The Aurora Consurgens um, is around the same time as the Heiligen Dreifaltigkeit, whereas the, the Book of the Holy Trinity usually uses quasi-religious images with, with secular text. This actually, this is the one of the exceptions where there is a religious image. Mostly it's secular images with highly religious text. This is basically saying, okay, the Holy Trinity here is analogous to these three, it's not black, but it's blue, red, and white, the three color changes. Um, neither of them of themselves are God, all combined together are God, and it's the same with these three uh, color changes of, of uh, in the alchemical vessel. This is actually called a scutum fidei, a shield of faith, and it's a teaching image uh, for Christianity, uh, where basically, okay, um, the father alone is not is God, but the father is not the son and so forth. So 
the substances here, none of them are the other, but they all together make the philosopher's stone. And it, none in itself is sufficient. Here you have the Holy Trinity together symbolizing the stone. And it experiments with the hermaphrodite again, but in a different way. This is a successful hermaphrodite. This is the unsuccessful one. Um, and what's interesting here is I mentioned, uh, probably feels like hours ago, that Mercury sometimes is seen as the mediator between the two opposing qualities, the male and female ones. Here, this is a mercurial eagle, weirdly with loads of baby little eagles uh, on the bottom. But this is the woman, this is the man in a weirdly tripod shape. She's holding a night creature. This is a hare, a day creature, and the two of them are united. This, if you see, is a parody of it. It's an ape, literally. Its tripod instead is a fish, hay, and uh, a leg. Um, it's uh, playing a lobster as music with a snake as the bow. It's got a, an owl unharmoniously tootling away on something uh, and basically successful and unsuccessful. So this is the sort of Lucifer and his mother version in the Aurora Concergens. Going back to the Emerald Tablet, the wind bore it in its belly. We have actually quite a beautiful representation. We have a sort of combination of calcination and washing, black and white. Okay. Um, and we have this image of the wind carrying the stone in its belly. This is sometimes described as a sword with a snake, but to be honest, obsessively looking at this and other images, it seems to be a sword and the sword belt for some reason, which are um, which symbolize the stone. And it's interesting if you look around at the same time, art history wise, you see that the representation of the, the, the two mothers meeting, Mary and Anne, of Christ and John the Baptist are shown in a similar way, this sort of opening in the belly. So it's interesting how an alchemical text drawing on religion to a certain extent is, is drawing on religious art of the period. But it's pathology as well. So here we have our mercury decapitating bodies. Here we have um, a, a 16th century version of that, again with dismemberment. Um, you chemists, after all, chopping up bodies left, right and centre. Um, here is a mercurial dangerous spirit with both a sword, but also um, a sort of an arrow or a spear, because basically the elixir that you need to either transmute metals or to heal bodies has to be penetrative. It has to penetrate the pores of, of the sick bodies. And, and this is a symbol of just how penetrative they can be. Uh, apologies to any Freudians around who wonder what I'm talking about. You also get the constructive elements. You've got the alchemist mixing pasta, um, the ingredients of the stone, and it literally does say pasta, but also you've got uh, the, the allegorical content. You've got an Ouroboros, symbols of repeat distillation. Um, here, a mercurial dragon. You have a volatile mercury as a winged version. And then you have, that looks like a, a dark version of that bird in Snoopy, but basically it's, it symbolizes calcination, burning, the negredo, the raven or crow, and of course there's a lot of fire there. Okay, we're nearly there. I, I, I basically, all I just want to do is not discuss this. Um, Jenny Rampling at Princeton is really the world's expert on the Ripley Scrolls. This is the end of the Middle Ages in the 15th century, and you get Okay, an alchemist, sometimes this is Hermes, Jenny thinks it might be Merlin, uh, talking about a hidden stone, and basically, I'm not going to analyse this, but here you've got your reptile, poisonous reptile as it were, um, you've got this idea of the transformation of the elements, um, you've got lots of um, processes going on, all watched eagerly by clerics, um, the guy who made this, George Ripley, or to whom it's attributed, is a, a canon in Bridlington in Yorkshire, um, you've got Adam and Eve there, you've got this, the soul of the substance being stolen away by Melusine, this uh, medieval shapeshifter. Um, lots of um, distillation and dissolution going on. Uh, here we have uh, soul, body and spirit of matter. We have the four elements, fire, earth, water and air. So basically, and then we have, okay, dragons and lions. This is the 15th century. This is still serious alchemical material. The motifs have increased over the centuries. Uh, they become more figurative in at least the examples I'm giving you. Some are recipe books with absolutely none of this, but this is all serious stuff, but it needs decoding. Uh, the feathers are all to do with sublimation, substances which are you know, rising into the air. But I'm gonna end 
um, with this uh, marginal drawings of apparatus. This is an incunabula uh, or incunabulum uh, of Geber's Summa Perfectionis, published just in the first uh, before 1500s, meaning uh, it, it, an incunabulum is in the cradle, the, the, the dawn of printing. Um, and it's an early publication where someone has read the instructions for the furnace design and has drawn a design uh, in the margin. And there we end with alchemical primal matter and probably a heaves of relief from you. Let me close this. Okay. Um, silence and shell shock, probably. Peter, can How you just turn my mute off now? Can you hear me, Peter? I'm just hoping again. Hoping. Okay, I'm just reading some. Oh wow, loads of loads of comments. Can I just have a look through the comments? Okay. Uh, okay, I can hear you fine. Good. Okay, I'm interested in an alchemist who is said to have lived in a churchyard. I think this could have been Simon Foreman. Sorry for shouting, don't worry, I didn't hear because I couldn't, can't hear any of you. Simon Foreman living in a churchyard, I'm not sure about that. Simon Foreman lived in London and uh, was certainly interested in alchemy. He writes some extremely interesting things. He even does horoscopes to check before an alchemical experiment, to check m m many things. For example, are his assistants reliable? Do a horoscope to check. Are the books he's got good? Do a horoscope to check. Are there evil spirits who are going to mess up your experiment? Because when you go, they go wrong, you know an evil spirit is there. He does all of that. But Simon Foreman, yeah, lived in London. Lauren Cassell uh, at uh, HBS in Cambridge has written a lot about Simon Foreman. So I'm not sure about the living in churchyards. Salisbury, okay. But you, I mean, the thing is, Alchemy comes through the clergy. That's how it enters in the 12th century, you know, and, and all through the period, you've got bishops, archbishops, even some popes, though not all, certainly, um, do, performing alchemy, you know, doing it. So um, someone living in a church on doing alchemy wouldn't surprise me to a certain extent. Um, Lord knows what they're using as their primal matter. Um, if they're, I hope they're not taking it literally. Okay, find a dead body and do something with it. Is the red elixir the same as red mercury? To be honest, there are so many um, ideas about substances. Basically, anything that's read, uh, alchemists get excited by and start um, wondering about that. I mean, I find it interesting. If you look at cinnabar, I only have dull red versions of cinnabar, but cinnabar is, is you know, it, it's used to create vermilion, the color red, but it's made from mercury and sulfur. So you can see how anyone coming up with the stone that's red, they start finding uh, interested in it. And to be honest, all I can say is if red mercury does something that seems like one of the end products of alchemy, then for some alchemists, they'd say yes. Though I have to say, um, Kunrat, the guy I study, he does have in one of his engravings, Ah, my dear roast chicken, all that glitters is not gold. So be very careful, pay attention to color changes, but don't automatically assume if it's shiny, then it's gold. It could be brass, you know. Um, was there a suggestion of the correct proportions of mercury and sulfur to make gold? You, yeah, you get, I mean, you do. You, you get various alchemists, though. Um, they read their Geber, but Geber doesn't necessarily give the correct proportions, so other people try to. Um, and some people go to extremes with this. Um, in the uh, early 16th century, there's a guy called Giovanni Pantheo in uh, Venice. He does um, experiments with words that are significant in alchemy. He tries to decode them cabalistically to find numbers, and these numbers of the words then intimate to him of the correct proportions. Um, you even find J Jabir, whom I, I mentioned, um, uh, the the um, the eighth century alchemist. He does similar things where he decodes Arabic names to try and get the same proportions. They get sometimes inspired, sometimes desperate. Um, but yeah, you do get some who are interested in that, Yakin. Uh, what else? Why did the alchemists have such confidence in their theoretical framework with a few? To be honest, um, I think because of the epiphenomena, you know, you might be looking for the Philosopher's Stone, but you're finding other products on the way. And I think we overdo the Philosopher's Stone angle. Uh, you know, some of them are doing uh, amazing distillations, and, and which is far easier 
but distilling is is part of their process of the learning curve to try and get the stone so to be honest I think the the stone is in aspiration but it's not that they're sitting in their lab laboratories 24 hours a day trying to make the stone they're, they're investigating the properties of matter I mean certainly and that's what I tell my students, you know, they're, they're finding out what can and can't be made. They're, they're interested, for example, in, in production of glass. They're interested, uh, I mean, Fermier, you know, the famous artist, he had an alchemist mixing his paints for him. So they're interested in pigmentation. So to be honest, they, they got enough positive results to believe in alchemy, even if some of them began to think that the Philosopher's Stone itself, it's more the journey than the destination. You know, I know that's a bit of a glib answer, but but really, I, I would say that is the case. That's one reason why people persevere, um, especially when the Paracelsians in the 16th century get into chemical medicine. You know, they notice, for example, that antimony, which can be used to separate gold from other ore, antimony is also used as an emetic and a purgative in the human body. I didn't use a vile woodcut I have of someone taking antimony and then bleh, you know you don't want to see it especially around tea time but but so they they're interested in this again what can these substances be used for okay oh cousin mother was a great devotee of bonus oh that's interesting i had no idea thanks uh, bonus's ideas of philosopher's stone is this why churches tolerate alchemists living Woof. i mean the thing is don't forget that most of these people in the Middle Ages, they are priests and clerics. I mean, who else can read? You know, aristocrats, but, but actually the majority of people working with these texts, um, and they're in Latin. I mean, I, gave, I showed you the Book of the Holy Trinity. Now that's around 1419, and it's the first German vernacular alchemical text. So until early 1400s, everything is in Latin. And if you if you're reading Latin, then you're either a priest or you've been trained by one, and, and which means you're an aristocrat. So um, to be honest, that's one of the ideas why the church tolerates it. And also, I have to say, you know, if John of Rupestrisser is saying alchemy is good for cures and medicines, then you know um, religious fraternities are going to approve of that. And to be honest. Are you really telling me that churches are not interested in looking for other uh, ways of attaining uh, treasure and gold as well for whatever purpose? You know, I, maybe I'm being a bit more cynical there, but, uh, you know, it's it's everyone is looking for funding. Queen Elizabeth I, who um, was always short of funds, partly because her father spent most of them. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I, Lady of the Bedchamber, you know, the, the person who generally helps you get dressed and everything, was an alchemist. So can you imagine getting dressed and talking with your, you know, lady of the bedchamber about alchemy experiments? Queen Elizabeth, as most aristocrats, was always short of money. You know, they'd have to go to the Medici's for loans. And, and so, yeah, any, any way of getting uh, success in these areas. And, and I think what's hard to think now, when you look back at alchemy, it's a quaint medieval practice. But at the time, it was cutting edge, you know. Um, it's not quaint. It, it's wow. They're, they're investigating matter. They're interested in transformation and they're producing products that sound really interesting. Uh, when Paracelsus comes along, even though Paracelsus tends to irritate and annoy everyone, a lot of his followers are probably far, are far more diplomatic and they're employed by the Holy Roman Emperor. You know, one of the two most powerful people in the Christian world. And many aristocrats have Paracelsians, because they are really, they're doing the hot stuff, well, hot stuff, sorry, they're alchemists, of course it's hot, but they're, they're doing really exciting stuff. Uh, the meaning of the Ouroboros in Christian alchemy. Ooh, um, so, well, the Ouroboros, we get early on, um, in some of the earliest alchemical texts, uh, linked with Cleopatra in antiquity, okay, um, you get the Ouroboros, and already then it's a symbol, I mean, because the Ouroboros in general hieroglyphics means eternity. Uh, you know, the, the snake swallowing its tail is just time and eternity, and the idea is that every scale on the Ouroboros' body is a different star in the heavens. But with alchemy, it's repeat distillation. 
the serpent swallowing its own tail. It's distilling, you're distilling things again and again. I mean, symbolically, it's seven, probably because of the seven metals in the Ptolemaic cosmos or the seven, sorry, the seven planets. But but that's what it is. In Christian alchemy, there's not much difference. It's, it's it, again, it's repeat distillation. You don't get it as eternal wisdom, which I'm surprised about because you think, okay, you know, it's eternity. And Christ sometimes is connect, connected with, with uh, the serpent. Uh, you know, in the, um, is it the book of Exodus, where you've got Moses and the, the brazen serpent on the cross, which is seen as a prefiguration of Christ. But oddly enough, I don't remember a Christian reading of that. Um, sorry, I'm just going down the chat. I'm really sorry I can't hear you. Uh, Bishop Thornborough, oh, Thornborough, John Thornborough. Litho Theorikos, that's a really interesting text. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he definitely had alchemical interests. Uh, lived in Salisbury in some form. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Alan, thank you for that. Thornborough is really interesting. He is. Um, John D. Elizabeth Alchemist, yeah. Though John Dee's um, a, a sidekick or assistant, Edward Kelly, did better with alchemy, well, sort of, um, uh, in that he was in theory, did transmutations at the court of Rudolf II. The only thing is Rudolf got too interested in him and locked him in a tower until he gave the secrets of alchemy. Edward has tried to escape, broke his leg and apparently died of septicemia. So make sure if you know aristocrats never to go to their towers. You know, that's a, the one piece of common sense from this talk. Was sandstone, which is red, ever linked to gold? Oof. I, to be honest, I don't know, uh, but you do get lots of stones discussed as candidates for transmutation and the Philosopher's Stone, um, yeah, really a huge variety of them. Uh, quite a lot, say flint, because flint create, is involving creating fire, so it's got a sort of occult property to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, if it's red, it, I mean, tomatoes, I'm sure, I'm joking, I'm being a bit facetious, but, you know, anything red, it could be you know, useful, um, but maybe not sandstone and gold. I think maybe that's pushing it a bit. Red powders though, you know, I mean, all, the thing is, they talk about it as a stone, but they often don't literally mean a stone. Uh, the guy I write about, Kunra, he says stone being German, is, he said, really it's to do with the German word stehen, that it stands. And basically it's a substance that can stand in fire. It can abide in fire without subliming. Uh, you know, without evaporating. And uh, this, it could be a powder, you know, it doesn't have to be literally a, you know, stone, like I'm Peter, so my mum obviously knew I was rock-headed. Um, so, so it doesn't have to be literal. Borhava distilled the same sample of mercury more than 500 times. Mmm, sounds academic, like you didn't have a life, but I'm being a bit rude there. Are you serious? More than 500 times? Wow. Yeah, yeah, I know that feeling. I can tell you, the, I'm grading essays at the moment. Um, thank you, thanks, Marco, for the the kind words. Um, does anyone have questions? I'm really sorry, I can't hear you. Um, that's a pain. Uh, you, I, hang on, let me just. Okay. Uva dot. And I'm giving you my email. If anyone's really interested. I mean, if, if anyone wants this PowerPoint, they are welcome to have it. Please don't put it online um, because I probably get in trouble with copyright for some of the images. Uh, and but um, you're very welcome. You know, can we be unmuted and visualised? Oh, I want to visualise you all. Now then, thank you for being such a quiet audience. <laughs> okay, bye, Peter. Peter's. Okay, waving me? his magic wand. I shouldn't say that. Okay, I think oh, you're just waving goodbye. Uh, okay, okay, folks.